In today's lesson, we're going to learn about undecidability. And that is just to say we're going to prove that certain languages or certain classes of languages are not decidable. We learned about decidability in our last lesson. So now we're trying to uh, show you some proofs of things that are not decidable. So before that, we need to talk a bit about the formalism that we're going to use in the, this final module. So we're going to use the Turing machine theory um, that I created in Coq. And this is a bit different than what you were using before for regular languages and for context-free languages. Um, so it, it requires a bit of an introduction. So first, as you know, I am implementing, basically I'm implementing the Sipser book on introdu introduction to theory of computing uh, in uh, using the Coq programming language. So the reason why I'm doing this is th that so is so that you can walk through any proof that is in the book that I covered and step through it uh, step by step. I'm going to explain the proofs a bit more informally so you get the intuition behind why things are happening the way they are. But at any point you can open the editor and step through the various finer details of the proof. And I hope that serves as a good um, you know, a uh, helper uh, for your own education. I'm always um, very excited about students that want to do a bit of research. So if you're interested in contributing both to uh, the various theories I've been defining in Coq, if you want, are interested in proving extra theorems and Lenmus, uh, please let me know. I'm always very happy to, to collaborate with people. Same goes for um, if you want to do any kind of summer projects, summer research projects uh, related to this course or a bit not so much related but still using the same techniques, I'd be very interested to, to think about something we, with you. So one thing that you might be wondering is why is proving is so important. And there are a few highlights I want to mention. And first, the first one has to do with generality, right? When you're doing a proof, you really have to think about all possible cases. So essentially, when you, you think about, when you, you're implementing an, an algorithm that is trying to serve a certain purpose, you are thinking about all possible cases. You are thinking with possibly without even a structure about how to handle all possible cases of input, uh, is my algorithm giving the right answer? So what a proof gives you is basically a formalism and a, a, set, of, a set of structured techniques to be able to reason about any kind of algorithm. So that's why, that's one of the, the things that is that some, sometimes people even forget. They, the key point that I'm trying to make is that you are doing proofs. You just don't know that you're doing them. And by learning how to prove, you will learn how to think about problems better. Another thing that I want, that I think is a very important uh, point, is to highlight the importance of rigor. Um, just saying that things work and believing them without you know, without knowing everything can be very dangerous. So it's very important, even when you're programming, to get your requirements right. You know, if you, you have a client, you really have to, to be very certain about lack of ambiguity because that could end up costing you a lot of money, especially if you're a, if you're a um, entrepreneur, right? If you're trying to do your own business, this can become really a problem if, if you have ambiguity in your contracts and all that. So that's something you really need to be mindful of. And what I hope this course will teach you is always ask more questions. But why does this, why doesn't this happen? And why does this step work the way it is? As you can see underlying in the use of a proof assistant, you can 
understand any point. And each each step of the proof is actually trivial. And that's what the, the checker of a proof is a very easy algorithm to implement, although it might not seem it actually is. Checking the, the correctness of a proof should be trivial. It's so stupid that a computer can do it. Now, coming up with a proof, that's another story, right? And what I want you to understand is that when you are learning something, especially something theoretical, you need to understand everything that is involved. You, you should not assume anything. You should question everything that is given you to understand exactly, precisely what each point means exactly. So you cannot have doubts on that. And I hope that this course kind of pushes you to think about that. Another thing that I think this course is so important is the, the importance of having models. So as we saw, we have certain abstractions uh, as Turing machines as models of computers and um, using regular expressions, which are equivalent to DFAs, which are equivalent to NFA. So they're just models of the same thing, which have very different benefits uh, and very different trade-offs. And the importance of having these modules, which are equivalent, is also a very important one. Um, and then all the effect that that has in reasoning about them. So, and this is where the proofs come in. If you're doing proofs on regular expressions, it's going to be very different from if you were doing it with DFAs or NFAs. So next, what we're going to see is basically how we represent what is in the book. And one thing you will see is that I leave unspecified what is the input. But before, when we were looking at regular ex regular expressions, when we're doing with proofs with regular expressions, the input, which is the string, was known, right? Was a list of ASCII characters. But now, because we want to think about things more abstractly, I'm leaving that unspecified. So essentially, the theory that you were learning before about regular languages and all that, that is separate. Although it's in the same repository, they're actually separate entities and, and modules. So don't try to use, you know, things from re lang in in the um, in this part because the code is different. So we have two things that aren't specified and I will show you I'll I'll do a short um code pass through to kind of uh, clarify this. But basically what I want to you to keep in mind is that the input which is the list of uh, characters is left unspecified. So you don't even know that it is a list. We're just saying there is some input. And this is how you write that in Coq. You just say variable, and then it's a global variable. Think of it like that. The same thing is, and that is to say the type is a global variable. So you don't even know what are the values. Same goes for the machine. This machine represents a Turing machine. And we don't really care about how you actually wrote the Turing machine. We just know that it exists. So there is some notion of a Turing machine, which we leave unspecified as well, but we are still able to prove quite a lot of things, as you will see. So what is next? Next, you will need to uh, learn about this, this notion of running a Turing machine, right? Because we leave the notion of what a machine is unspecified, the function that runs a machine must also be unspecified. And this running the machine is running it with a given input. And the idea is if you run it, you are able to know whether the machine either accepted that given input, rejected that given input, or looped for that given input. So are you even able to reason about that? So given what the function run specifies is something that given in the machine and an input gives you the result of running that Turing machine with that given input. So this is another concept or notion that is specified and or, or left unspecified. Um, and then we, you have something that is very close to what we saw before for regular languages. The way we define a language is just a predicate, right? It's something that takes an input and returns a proposition, right? So one way of if you see this in the book, this is kind of the same as writing all the elements X that are in the predicate P, which is a language. So knowing if an X is belongs to a certain language, as we saw before, is just the same as showing that 
the language um, holds for x, right? So it's that functional encoding that we we've been using it until so far, until now. Um, and we also saw how to represent a of n b of n using the this functional encoding, right? That's if you go to L five, that's basically how we defined um, a of n uh, b of n, right? We say it's a function that given an x, there must exist some some natural number such that x, the input, equals a of n b of n. So essentially saying that something is the language of a Turing machine, well, that's what is the language of a Turing machine? It's all the words that are accepted, all the inputs that are accepted by that machine. So a very easy way to define what is uh, acceptance of a Turing machine is just to write this predicate. So we know that a word is recognized by a certain uh, machine if by running it you get accept. Okay. So we know that a language recognize a machine recognizes the language if for all inputs if you run it it will it will accept that input for all if and only if the word is in the language. So this is the notion of recognizing a language, right? You, we say that a certain machine rec rec recognizes a certain language. In the book, we just say that L equals uh, some L of M, right? So all of this is, is pretty trivial, I hope. So then the rest of uh, today's lesson and in our next lesson, we're just going to prove some important theorems. Um, and what we want to understand is, first, we want to recall what is ATM, and then we're going to show that it is undecidable. And ATM is actually the acceptance of Turing machines, which which says, basically, this is the class of all the pairs. So you can think of it all inputs that are accepted by some language, by some machine, sorry. So basically, this represents... Um, an algorithm that given a Turing machine and giving some input, does that Turing machine accept that input? Right, so that's what we're trying to to figure out. And whether this is something that we can know. Um, so the question of decidability is, can we write an algorithm that given, given the source code of a, of a Turing machine and giving some input, can I know whether or not that Turing machine is going to accept that um, input and can I write an algorithm that is that does not loop right it's decidable so you must always be able to give that answer for any kind of Turing machine is this possible and what we're going to show is that it is not possible so it's not possible to implement an algorithm right some code that you write in whatever language you choose it's not possible to write a code that given a Turing machine aka a program and some input it will know whether that input accepts that, uh, sorry, that program accepts that input. That is what we're trying to figure out. And then we're going to show that uh, L is decidable if and only if L is recognizable and co-recognizable. We're going to introduce what co-recognizable means. And then we're going to show that the complement of ATM is unrecognizable. That means that there is no Turing machine that is able to recognize this algorithm, this uh, proposition. So we're going to see what that means. Um, but unrecognizability means that there is no algorithm that can say yes if and only if this thing holds. Right. Uh, finally, we're going to show that there are some languages that are unrecognizable. Is this recognizable and co-unrecognizable? I don't know. Uh, 418. I need to double check this one. Um, Right. And then why do we want to know this? Because we want to know whether or not we can write programs that reason about other programs. Right. So ATM just represents all possible programs that you may write. And knowing just by looking at the source code, am I able to decide, is this program going to accept that input? That's a very powerful thing to know. Right? And in fact, we're going to show that that is impossible. You cannot write a program that always says yes or no. Right? What you may be able to write, and that's what we're going to show, is that 
you are able to say yes, you know, write a program that given some code and given some input, it's going to say yes whenever that program says yes. But if the program does not say yes, you might be able to loop. And that will become very obvious in a second. Okay, so in the next video, we're going to prove that ATM is undecidable.